Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Specialist at Union Station at the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium. And thanks for joining me on this chilly Monday evening, afternoon, uh, whatever time it is, wherever you're watching. We've got people watching from, uh, we've had people watching from all over the world. So as a reminder, this is a live stream. So let us know where you're watching from. I love hearing uh, where everybody's tuning in from. And if you have any questions or shout outs or uh, you just want to say hi, put those in the comments section. Uh, and uh, we'll have a lot of fun today. If you're tuning in for the first time, uh, welcome. Uh, we've been live streaming uh, just about once a week for the past almost year. It's pretty crazy. This is live stream number 59. Holy guacamole. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm so thankful that uh, everybody has supported us uh, through all those times. And if you're tuning in for the first time, don't worry. You can rewatch all of our past live streams on our YouTube channel. Uh, just search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium on YouTube and you can find us there. Uh, and if you're a returning watcher, welcome back. I know we've got some of you in the audience uh, who have tuned in every week, which is just incredible. I'm so, so uh, grateful and humbled that uh, people want to spend their Monday nights with us. So it's so great seeing uh, uh, familiar faces. And uh, please let us uh, or let us know you're watching in the comments and give us a shout out. Uh, and let us uh, know you've tuned in again. Um, so uh, welcome back. Today's deep dive will be all about, uh, well, a couple of different topics, actually. It's kind of a hodgepodge, but uh, since tomorrow is Groundhog Day, I figured we could talk a little bit about time travel, uh, which makes sense if you've seen the movie Groundhog Day, uh, where there is a time loop involved. So we're going to use that as an excuse to talk a little bit about time travel. Um, and also, I'm going to use that as an excuse to talk a little bit about one of my favorite genres in fiction, which is called retrofuturism. Um, so it's just going to be kind of a, a hodgepodge of a couple different topics I've been wanting to cover. Uh, hopefully, we'll keep it short. I say that every week and it ends up being an hour long um so uh we'll uh do our best to keep things under an hour this week of course and uh yeah i know we have people tuning in uh over time so i want to make sure i uh redo some of my earlier shout outs just reminding everybody but this is a live stream we are live on monday night here in kansas city uh and so if you're watching and you want to say hi be sure to post in the comment section a hello if you have any questions about uh anything we're talking about or just about life in general i give great advice then put those in the comments too uh and then also let us know where you're watching from it's always super fun to hear from everybody uh and already we've gotten people uh commenting and chiming in. Dustin says, hello from snowy Philadelphia. Thanks for watching, Dustin. I uh, hope it warms up there sooner rather than later. We'll see what Puxitani Phil says tomorrow morning, right? Uh, Nicholas is watching from Lake of the Ozarks. Excellent. Thanks for tuning in, Nicholas. Pamela saying hello from Virginia Beach. I miss my hometown. Uh, if you're from Kansas City, then Kansas City misses you too. Although wherever you're from, your hometown misses you as well. One of our longtime watchers, Chris, is chiming in saying hello, Patrick. Well, hello, Chris. Thanks for watching again. Glad you would join, are joining us again on this lovely Monday evening. And another longtime watcher, Patience, is watching saying good evening. Well, good evening right back to you, Patience. Thanks for watching and thanks for tuning in yet again. We've got Jessica tuning in. Thanks for tuning in, Jessica. Uh, Jessica says, thanks for doing such awesome live streams, Patrick. Well, thanks, Jessica. Thank you for being awesome as well. Eric is watching as well, and Granny, both saying hello from Lexa. Hello, Eric, and hello, Granny. <laughs> Ashley says hello from Warrensburg, Missouri. Wow, awesome. Ashley, thanks for watching. Uh, and Patience says, an hour. Psh, what is an hour for space travel? <laughs> that is a good point, and we may talk about time and uh, all the wibbly-wobbly things that come with that during our stream today. Uh, so thank you everybody who's commented and don't forget if you are watching, be sure to post in the comments and we're gonna make a marker here uh, in the, uh, the um, in our notes here. So uh, if you've commented uh, since uh, now, then I will uh, check back in in a little bit uh, to check our comments. So thank you to everybody who is commenting. Uh, oh, by the way, how about them Chiefs? Very excited for this Sunday. Hopefully we'll have good news to talk about on next week's Monday live stream. Uh, in case you didn't know, we are at the Super Bowl yet again, second year in a row. Um, all right, so I like to start my live streams uh, talking about some space news. And actually there were a couple of pretty cool topics uh, and uh, little news snippets that came up over the, over the past week. So I wanted to start uh, actually by talking a little bit about that and uh, sharing with you some uh, spacey news stories. So we're gonna start with this cool 
story. Let me jump go, jump back over here. So uh, this is an article, a research article published uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. Very cool. Um, and, but to summarize it, basically, um, there uh, have been studies conducted about Mars and specifically about uh, the ice on Mars. Uh, and uh, the re this research, recent research paper was published um, just this week uh, talking about the ice ages on Mars. Now, uh, just like on Earth, uh, glaciers have flowed across the surface of Mars uh, in its distant past. As we know, Mars had a lot of water on it in its distant past. Some of that was liquid water, some of it was frozen water. Now, Earth's glaciers um, have mostly receded and are still shrinking, as we know. Thank you, global warming. Um, Mars's glaciers are, are frozen in place and they're covered by rocky debris. So there are a lot of glaciers on Mars, but they've been mostly static uh, for as long as we've been observing. Now, uh, the question that scientists uh, have asked is, we weren't sure if there was one huge ice age on Mars or if there were multiple ice ages spread out over millions of years. Now, this new study here, uh, which was uh, just announced, uh, from researchers at Colgate University in New York uh, is helping to answer some of those questions. So this uh, study is suggesting that Mars has undergone anywhere from half a dozen to 20 ice ages in the past several several hundred million years, which is pretty cool. Uh, so the researchers analyzed glaciers in uh, great detail. They examined uh, rocks sitting on top of the glaciers, uh, and this rocky debris has been covering this frozen ice for about 300 million years. They study the sizes, distributions, and number of rocks on top of the glaciers. Uh, and um, basically they concluded that uh, based on uh, the distribution of rocks and uh, how they uh, were distrib distributed in an unexpected way, they weren't grouped together by size, but they were actually spread sort of scattered randomly. Um, and uh, this uh, led researchers to uh, realize that the rocks had been traveling along inside the glaciers um, and not eroding as they had been expected. Uh, and uh, this uh, basically uh, suggests that there were distinct separate flows of glaciers over um, spans of millions of years, so multiple ice ages. Uh, if you want to learn more about Mars, by the way, we did a live stream on Mars on August 10th. And just as a reminder, if you missed out earlier, I did mention our YouTube channel, the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium, uh, our page there. It uh, does have all of our streams, all of our past streams. Uh, and if you do have a YouTube account or a Google account, you don't even need a YouTube account, uh, head over there and give us a subscription. Uh, subscribe and like some of our videos there. That will help our uh, YouTube channel a lot. If we get to 100 subscribers, then we get to be official and verified, so to speak. So that would be really awesome. I think we're at 70-something, so just a couple more subscribers. So head on over to YouTube and give us a subscription there if you wouldn't mind. Uh, that would help us a lot. Um, so let's uh, turn our attention to the moon. Here's... Uh, another uh, uh, little uh, study, actually a collection of papers published uh, about uh, the moon. And there were uh, basically a number of uh, astronomers or a group of astronomers specifically that are making a case for putting telescopes on the moon. Uh, so there is a series of newly published papers here. You can see uh, by the uh, on the Royal Society website, uh, which is a, a UK uh, collection of scientists, basically. Um, and uh, basically, these scientists are arguing that our uh, nearest neighbor, the moon, especially its far side, would make an excellent place for telescopes, uh, especially in the radio and infrared range, which is extremely important. Uh, you may have been following along, uh, unfortunately, a sad uh, news in the radio telescope uh, sphere, uh, but the Arecibo telescope, the largest radio telescope, did undergo a significant structural collapse uh, just in the past couple months. So we no longer have a really good radio telescope here on Earth. So. Uh, these astronomers are arguing that probably uh, putting telescopes on the moon would be uh, really great. Um, so uh, that, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll just leave it at that basically. Um, so, uh, all right, so let's continue on. Uh, there. Are, so again, those papers uh, you can read uh, talk about uh, putting telescopes on the moon. Uh, and, and speaking of the moon, uh, here is uh, another a little uh, snippet that was published recently. You can go back over here. Uh, so, um, let's see, I've lost my place in my notes. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. Uh, so, um, so just announced this week, uh, there is now evidence that water uh, is being created on the moon thanks to Earth's magnetosphere, which is kind of crazy. Um, so we know that there's water on the moon. We've talked about it actually in the past few weeks. Uh, there have been some pretty exciting announcements discovering a lot of sources of water uh, on the moon, Earth's moon. Uh, not a lot of water, obviously not oceans, but there is some water on the moon. Um, and uh, before Apollo, we thought the moon was totally dry, uh, dry as a desert because of the extreme temperatures and harsh environment. Um, but we have uh, discovered a lot of lunar water. A lot of it is frozen in ice, uh, shaded in craters near the poles. Um, but uh, 
A recent study published, uh, thanks to findings by the Chandrayaan uh, spacecraft, which is the first Indian lunar probe, has detected a lot uh, more surface water on the moon than we previously thought. Now, this surface water should be evaporated uh, as the moon passes through Earth's magnetosphere. Um, but actually, this study, uh, along with some other studies published by uh, the Japanese Space Agency, thanks to the uh, Kaguya satellite and NASA's Themis and Artemis program, have also uh, confirmed these findings. Uh, basically, the Earth's magne magne magnetic field, excuse me, actually does the opposite. It doesn't evaporate water on the moon, it actually replenishes surface water uh, by flows of magnetospheric ions, which scientists call earth wind. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. The earth is actually giving water to the moon, which is just kind of a crazy uh, thing that almost seems like out of the realm of science fiction. Um, here's uh, another uh, bit of more of a sobering news uh, fact that was just published So this is a Rutgers-led study uh, that was just published um, and in the Journal of Nature. And basically this study has confirmed that Earth is hotter now than it has been in the past 12,000 years, <laughs> and perhaps the last 128,000 years, according to uh, our most recent annual global temperature uh, data. So uh, there was a big debate in the realm of cli climate change known as the Holocene temperature conundrum. Basically this describes uh, a debate between different scientists about how temperatures change over the Holocene, which is the past 12,000 years, basically the age of, of humans, essentially recorded human history. Um, and uh, there were some previous uh, reconstructions that suggested that uh, the average temperatures during the Holocene actually peaked uh, 10,000 years ago and that the planet has been cooling since then. But our new climate model, which has been corroborated by a lot of other research, now suggests that global te temperatures have actually risen over the past 12,000 years with the help of factors like greenhouse gases and emissions uh, due to climate change. So this new study eliminates pretty much any doubts about the key role of carbon dioxide and global warming uh, and confirms uh, these climate simulations. And so you can see here uh, just a a chart showing uh, the uh, the effects of our uh, CO2 on uh, rising greenhouse gases, annual temperatures, things like that. Um, it just uh, to give a little background about the study, uh, basically these scientists use marine uh, calcareous, uh, which are uh, calcium carbonate containing fossils from uh, uh, foraminifers, uh, which are single-celled organisms that live at the ocean surface. Um, I must uh, add a disclaimer, I'm not a biologist by any means. But anyway, they use these, uh, these uh, single-celled organisms to actually reconstruct temperature histories of the two most recent warm intervals on Earth. Um, they're the last uh, interglacial periods from uh, 128,000 to 115,000 years ago, and then the Holocene, uh, this most recent era. Uh, so these fossils collected uh, cores from bottom sediment near um, uh, uh, rivers and in pa or around Papua New Guinea, uh, and uh, they uh, basically looked at these sediments and studied these uh, microorganisms uh, to help uh, build this climate model. Um, also, another fun announcement, uh, the year 2020, uh, based on recently released data from NASA and NOAA, uh, 2020 has, is now tied for the warmest year on record in human history, tied with 2016. So congrats, 2020, as if you needed another record to break. So anyway, uh, warmest year on record. Very exciting. By the way, if you want to learn more about climate change, we discussed climate change uh, during our Mercury and Venus live stream on October 12th uh, last year, so you can learn all about the warming Earth there. Oh, and one last bit of news. We were tracking this um, on our uh, Facebook page, if you didn't know, um, but uh, here is just a little summary of the Starship SN9 test. So this is the next rocket designed by SpaceX. Um, here is SN9 and SN10, which is the next test, uh, both on the launch pad. First time we've had two of these rockets on a launch pad together. Um, and so uh, the original launch attempt was supposed to be sometime last week, uh, but it was scrubbed repeatedly because there were some iffy uh, things with the FFA uh, clearing their launch. Right now uh, they are waiting on clearance and they're planning on launching tomorrow, Tuesday. Um, and this launch would take this uh, giant 10 meter rocket to about 10 kilometers, uh, matching the SN8 test, which we covered a couple months ago. Hopefully uh, SN9 will have a softer landing than SN8 though. <laughs> then SN10 is already the launch pad. Don't know when that flight's gonna be um, or uh, about it. Its profile, but um, that should be coming in the near future. So stay tuned, space fans, 
for updates about those rockets. All right, a bunch more people chiming in. That's so awesome. We're going to start our main topic, but first of all, I wanted to give shout outs to uh, Amy watching from Blue Springs. Amy says, Aloha. Thanks for watching, Amy. Uh, I recognize your Aloha. I bet you're, I think you're a returning watcher. Uh, Kristen says, Springfield, Missouri will be visiting Friday to see the Chiefs display. There is an awesome Chiefs display at Union Station. Please remember, though, uh, to respect social distancing and to wear a mask. We do require them at all times inside Union Station, but very, very cool Chiefs display uh, to check out there. So I uh, hope you come see it, Kristen. Uh, Ari says, uh, watching from Grandview. Thanks for watching. Daniela, uh, watching yet again. One of our other watchers says, you're amazing, Patrick. You're amazing, Daniela. Thanks for tuning in again. Genevieve, uh, planetarium live streams are the best part of Mondays. I agree, Genevieve. I definitely agree. Emily saying hello from Hope, Kansas. Thanks for watching, Emily. Uh, Stephanie watching. Uh, I love weekly space news updates. Great. I'm glad you enjoy them, Stephanie. I do too. I know it takes a little bit of time in our live streams, but hopefully it's great. Uh, you guys enjoy just kind of being up to date with all the cool space announcements. Uh, Nicholas says, how about those Chiefs? That's right, Nicholas. We're very excited. Uh, Elizabeth, hello from Southeast, uh, Southeast Iowa. We'll be there Thursday for the dinosaurs. Go Chiefs. Yes, uh, we are in the final week, I believe, of our uh, dinosaur road trip exhibition. So if you missed it, be sure to check that out. You don't want to miss it. It's a lot of fun. In fact, some days this week, I'll be down there showing off fossils. That's right. I have a, a, my a second uh, love of science is paleontology. So you'll be able to maybe catch me downstairs in the dino exhibit showing off some cool fossils. Uh, Terry says, love this. Watching from Overland Park, Kansas. Go Chiefs. Yes, Terry. Elizabeth, hello from Southeast Iowa. Oh, I already said that, Elizabeth. Oh, that's just copy. No worries. Uh, thanks for watching, Elizabeth. Uh, Terry says, oh, another copy. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my place here. Uh, Eric, uh, having an Omega-13 device would be mighty handy. Ooh, in reference to uh, time travel and uh, the very excellent... Um, uh, Galaxy Quest movie, one of my all-time favorites. Uh, Beth, how can people get to Mars without dying? Well, Beth, yeah, I would suggest checking out our Mars live stream if you want to learn more about that. And again, that was uh, our live stream on August 10th, where we talk about Mars and maybe going to Mars. Uh, Amy says, SpaceX, you're cleared for flight. Hopefully, Amy. Fingers crossed. Tammy says, hello from Iowa. Thanks for watching, Tammy, one of our longtime watchers. And Brian is tuning in from KCK. Thanks for watching, Brian. Appreciate you and your support. All right. So uh, with 15 minutes in the can, we are going to jump into our main topic, which is time travel and retro futurism. And we're going to start with Groundhog Day, since it is just about Groundhog Day. Now, don't forget, if you have any questions or you want to give a shout out, we are still open in the comment section, so feel free to chime in there. And let us know what your favorite time loop movie is. There are a lot of amazing time loop movies. Groundhog Day is just one of them, in fact. Um, there are tons of other time loop movies. Uh, there is Edge of Tomorrow, a really awesome action time loop movie. Uh, Palm Springs is one that came out uh, last year, I believe. Uh, and Palm Springs is uh, a kind of a comedy uh, a sort of mystery uh, time loop. I would definitely suggest checking that one out. Uh, there's one called Source Code, which is another science fiction time loop movie. Um, it's uh, by the director who made Moon, which is kind of an indie uh, science fiction movie. A lot of people don't know about that. There's Primer, which is a mind-bending movie about time travel. Looper, which is uh, a movie my head's right in front of. Um, and that's a really cool action movie uh, with a time loop as well. Um, technically, A Christmas Carol involves time travel and a time loop, you could argue. Doctor Strange as well. Elmo Saves Christmas, the holiday classic. <laughs> and um, a couple others. Happy Death Day is a horror movie that involves a time loop. But the most famous one that really started it all is Groundhog Day. And Groundhog Day involves time travel in a way. You know, you, we could argue about uh, science fiction and fantasy and how that all works. Of course, they never really explained the science of how Groundhog Day works. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about how the science of uh, time travel might work today. Now, we've talked about this a couple times on our live streams, but we're just going to kind of condense all of everything we've talked about. Um, and uh, just to... Uh, kind of backtrack a little bit. Uh, when we talk about time travel, um, we really need to start with uh, talking about the speed of light. Because when we're talking about um, traveling anywhere, we need to talk about speeds. And the speed of light is the fastest thing in the universe. Now, scientists and philosophers going all the way back to the 5th century uh, BCE theorized that light had a finite speed. So we were starting to think about light in this way all the way back, uh, way, way back in time. Um, before modern science. Um, and Michael Faraday in 1834 linked electricity and magnetism. Of course, we call light electromagnetic radiation to this day. Uh, and then in 1861, uh, James Maxwell uh, derived his famous wave equations, which connected electric and magnetic fields. So uh, he discovered that these electromagnetic waves, that he called them, um, travel at a very specific speed. And uh, strangely, according to his equations, this speed was constant and not measured relative to anything. And we know today that uh, light is has a constant 
speed. No matter uh, where you are and what your relative uh, speed or position, light will always be the exact same speed. And that is a universal constant. And that is 278 or 279,000. Uh, seven hundred. Wait, two. Wait, two hundred two seven nine seven nine. Yeah, no, it's two hundred seventy nine thousand. Um, sorry, that was me pressing the wrong button. Two hundred ninety nine thousand seven hundred ninety two. Sorry, I mixed up my numbers there. Two hundred ninety nine thousand seven hundred ninety two kilometers per second is the speed of light, or one hundred eighty six thousand two hundred eighty two miles per second, and that is uh, the speed of light. So, uh, so again, um, everything else besides light moves at relative speeds. When we measure speed, we measure speed of things relative to each other. When you're traveling uh, uh, 60 miles per hour on the highway, you're traveling 60 miles per hour relative to something stationary next to the highway, right? Um, astronauts aboard the International Space Station are moving uh, above us at about five miles per second relative to us here on Earth right now. Uh, assuming all of us watching are here on Earth, if anybody is watching from away from Earth, uh, please give us a chatter in the comments. That'd be very exciting. <laughs> so, so again, light uh, will always be measured at the same speed, no matter your relative speed or position. Um, now this is uh, this is the way the universe is built, and because of that, there are of course some consequences. Now Albert Einstein, one of the most famous scientists ever to live, he had a really interesting thought experiment that will kind of inform our ideas about time travel. Now in his experiment, he imagined two mirrors uh, that acted like sort of a clock. So uh, we can imagine this clock uh, working using a, a beam of light, a photon, bouncing between these mirrors back and forth. Now we're imagining this in a vacuum without any any outside forces, but just this this uh, thought experiment, we're imagining these two mirrors um, bouncing a, p a beam of light together back and forth. Now, if we started moving these mirrors side to side, if we move this clock, right, the clock of mirrors side to side, then the path of the light beam will start uh, to, uh, to move with it, right? Um, and uh, to a stationary observer, um, this uh, beam of light will appear uh, stationary right it'll appear to still be going back and forth so if we if we move this um back and forth like this there we go uh to us here on earth uh, or uh, you watching it looks like that beam of light um it, there the path is uh and now or sorry so I, i'm i'm getting this a little backwards so relative to these mirrors the beam of light is going to be stationary right it's going to be bouncing back and forth between these mirrors okay and if you were uh, standing with the mirrors as they're moving the beam of light would appear to be moving back and forth um but to whoops uh <laughs> there we go to um uh let's see all right, we're gonna go to the next one. But if we move that, uh, but if we were stationary and we were observing that clock moving back and forth, we would observe something a little bit different and it would look a little bit like this. Now this is kind of sped up, but you can kind of imagine the trail of this light will follow this path here, right? Um, so the to us, stationary, the beam of light will actually appear to kind of zigzag a little bit. Now remember, the speed of light is constant. Um, so if we, if we factor that all in, then it looks like that light is traveling a longer distance to get sort of the same to the same place or it's taking longer for the light to sort of tick back and forth um, so in, in this thought experiment uh, while really vague this is kind of a foundation of Einstein's theories of relativity imagining uh, just the differences between uh, speeds stationary and speeds relative so essentially um, to us being stationary this clock uh, that light on that clock will appear to take longer to get back and forth. So, so essentially, if we, if so, all things uh, being equal here, um, the clock, as viewed uh, from a stationary place on the ground, um, it will appear that the light took longer to get between the mirrors. But if you were on this clock, I imagine the clock was on a spaceship, uh, then the beam of light would appear to be moving back and forth stationary and it would appear uh, to travel less time, basically. Um, so this is how relatively, relativity all works. And uh, all this to say that moving clocks run slower than stationary clocks, okay? So if you have a clock that's moving, no matter how fast it's moving, it's going to run slower relative to stationary clocks. So your time is personal to you, basically. Um, so we don't know the, notice this in relative, uh, in regular life uh, because relativistic speeds are so much um, uh, much higher than uh, all the speeds we experience down here on earth but this is something that we do observe in real life uh, in science specifically uh, for example time moves slower on the international space station so uh, if you have a watch aboard the international space station because you're moving so quickly relative to us here on earth then your watch will move more slowly relative to the people on earth so uh, essentially 
imagine you've got your watch and you synchronize it with somebody here on Earth and you go up into space and you spend a year on the space station. Then you come back down to Earth. And basically, your watch, um, since it has traveled in space, would actually be 0.01 seconds behind a watch down on Earth. So also that means you have aged less, uh, less time than people on Earth. So, and that's just traveling at relatively slow speeds, uh, relative to the speed of light, of course. You know, five miles per second is nothing compared to 186,000 uh, miles per second. But it, it's still measurable. It's so measurable, in fact, that when we, ta when we uh, work on, uh, or when we design GPS satellites, satellites that help us to find our locations here on Earth that use light bouncing back and forth, we actually have to adjust for relativity um, by uh, adjusting for those time differences because... Um, these satellites are moving more quickly than us here on Earth. Uh, if you want to learn more about satellites, by the way, we did a whole live stream about it last week on the 25th of January. Check that out if you want to learn more about satellites. So um, we can expand this to an even greater degree. If you hopped aboard a spaceship that was able to travel 99.94% the speed of light, so extremely close to the speed of light, and you were on that spaceship for 10 years, just, I don't know, doing laps around this, uh, the solar system, uh, then when you came back to Earth, you would have aged 10 years because time would be relative to you. Um, you would experience time relative to you at that speed. But everybody on Earth would have aged 30 years. So you would have traveled into the future, essentially. You would have experienced 10 years of your life in real time, so to speak, but when you got back into Earth, to Earth, you would have traveled into the future. So time travel in the future is technically possible. And we're all really time travelers, technically, since we're all moving at relativistic speeds, just at a very, very tiny scale. What about traveling backwards in time, though? Because, you know, in a time loop movie like Groundhog Day, that involves traveling back in time at the end of the day, uh, or after something happens to him, he will travel back in time uh, to the beginning of his day. Now, backwards, uh, traveling backwards in time is more complicated, and right now we don't, we can't really explain it with physics, or we, we can't explain how it might be possible with physics. Essentially, we don't know if it's possible, and according to our modern understandings of physics, it seems like it probably isn't. Now, as you approach the speed of light, as I mentioned, time speeds up relative to you and slows down, uh, and you sort of slow down relative to everything else. Now, according to our current understandings of math and physics, if you were to a, exceed the speed of light, then mathematically time around you should move backwards, okay? So travel faster than the speed of light, go back in time. And now, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, um, mass and energy are one and the same, they're directly related. Um, and according to his equations, basically you would need infinite mass uh, to exceed the speed of light, essentially, which is really not possible under our current understandings of physics. So you'd have to either, you know, be able to exceed, uh, you, again, you'd have to have some way of, of creating infinite mass, um, either, you know, by uh, creating an object with infinite density or something like that. But even even black holes, which have infinite density, theoretically, um, are uh, have finite masses too. So infinite mass is something that our modern understanding and your understandings of physics don't really account for. Now, there are some cutting-edge understandings of physics, like quantum mechanics, for example, that um, could maybe explain this. Uh, for example, Stephen Hawking, uh, another famous scientist, um, uh, pushed a lot of interesting ideas about time travel, uh, and he theorized that uh, particles could exist that had negative energy density, um, which therefore would have negative mass, and this potentially could help these equations work out uh, to give you uh, access to backwards time travel. There's kind of a funny story about this, actually. Uh, Stephen Hawking, he famously tried to prove that backwards time travel was either possible or impossible in 2009. Uh, he threw a, a party that was exclusive to time travelers. So this party had, it was complete with balloons and champagne and a buffet, and he sent out invitations after the party. Um, so if there were time travelers any time in the future, then theoretically they should have come to this party uh, knowing that it was going to happen in the future. Um, unfortunately, nobody came to the party. So either uh, the party Stephen Hawking threw was just so lame that future time travelers didn't want to come or time travel is not possible. Uh, and again, this was just kind of a funny joke he made uh, that doesn't officially uh, explain that there's no such thing as time travel, but it is kind of a funny story. Uh, now, in 2018, uh, he did publish a book, uh, well, there was a book published posthumously, uh, posthumously uh, with writings by him, uh, where he discussed uh, the physics of wormholes. Now, a wormhole is one theoretical idea in physics and uh, astronomy that could potentially uh, help explain how backwards time travel could be plausible. Um, uh, basically, uh, the idea is connecting uh, two black holes or a black hole and another a theoretical object like a white hole. Um, 
to connect different spaces or different places in space-time, this a theoretical three-dimensional fabric of space. Um, and this is kind of a two-dimensional representation of what that might look like. Um, but so far, there aren't any theories that connect quantum mechanic physics with uh, Einstein's theory, general relativity theories. So uh, backwards time travel will have to stay in the realm of science fiction uh, for the time being. Now, um, you know, time travel and travel through space or faster than light travel is kind of intrinsically linked. As I mentioned, theoretically, if you could travel faster than light, then you could travel back in time. Of course, there are a lot of examples in, in fiction of people traveling faster than light. Um, for example, Star Trek uh, is one a good example of that. And a lot of the even a lot of these fictional explanations um, or, or even um, uh, scientists who try to explain how this could be possible using modern science, their ideas of traveling faster than the light kind of uh, exploit loopholes. Like there's this thing called an Alcubierre drive um, that doesn't actually make a ship fa travel faster than the light. Instead, it actually bends space around the ship to kind of move space around the ship instead of the ship through space. It's very complicated. And again, it's all uh, science fiction at this point, uh, explained through some sort of... Uh, some version of uh, theoretical physics um, uh, but again this is all science fiction uh, and uh, if, if you do want to learn more about uh, some of those uh, television shows that talk about science fiction on September 28th I did a live stream all about TV astronomy where we dive a little more in depth uh, with uh, Star Trek and all of the other uh, aspects of that show that um, uh, there are based in uh, more science fact that you might realize than science fiction so let's uh, jump back over to the comments and see uh, all of our watchers, patients, uh, says if we aged 10 and Earth age is 30, uh, so if we travel at 99.94% the speed of light, does that equal time travel forwards for you and not Earth? That's right. Yeah. So uh, so basically, patients, basically that spaceship turns into a time machine. Um, so if you were traveling near the speed of light uh, and then came back to Earth, uh, then uh, you will have aged less time than people on Earth. So technically, that's time travel. You know, if you were, if we were to extrapolate that um, and we traveled even faster, you know, 99.99999% the speed of light, then maybe you could just be in that spaceship for one week and then come back and it'll be 30 years in the future. Um, on, on the same token, if you were falling towards a black hole, the closer you got to the black hole, um, then time would speed up uh, away from you. Um, so essentially, if we were watching somebody falling into a black hole, uh, we would watch them slow down until they would appear frozen in space because as they were approaching the black hole, time is speeding up uh, to them relative to us. So basically, we would never be able to see something fall into a black hole. They would always appear perpetually stuck, sort of getting sucked towards that black hole. Uh, Brooke says, thank you, watching from KC Mo, go Chiefs. Heck yeah, go Chiefs, Brooke. Uh, Blake says, or sorry, Beth uh, says, uh, Primer is an awesome movie. I've seen it many times. Well, Beth, I might have to ask you to explain it to me sometime because uh, it is a bit complicated and confusing. There are all sorts of crazy charts I found online that connect all the different timelines and stuff, and it's, it's a bit mind-blowing. Um, so I'm glad you enjoyed it, Beth. Uh, I hope to enjoy it someday when I fully understand it. Uh, Lauren says, is the speed of light uh, an excellent thing to put on your car license plate? Uh, oh, it might be. That's a, a good point. Um, <laughs> uh, 299792. Uh, if you have a, a license plate in Kansas, you might find that that license plate is already taken. Emily says, solid ode to the Chiefs uh, in reference to my drink. Yep, um, well, I'm wearing red as well. Uh, but uh, yes, we are very excited for that. Eric says, all you need is a TARDIS. Indeed, referencing the uh, Doctor Who spaceship and time ship. Um, we've talked about Doctor Who in our TV astronomy stream as well. And again, that was on September 28th. So if you want to learn about the science of Doctor Who, then check that stream out. Now I want to talk about... Uh, one of my favorite genres in fiction, and that is retrofuturism. So let's uh, let me uh, try to stretch my topic here because in Groundhog Day, um, you know, he gets stuck in a time loop uh, and he never gets to go to the future. Well, imagine for a moment if we never got to go to the future. So imagine if uh, our ideas about the future were stuck in our ideas of the future before space travel. So before the space age uh, in uh, the early 1900s or even before that, uh, before the 1960s when the space race really took off, how did people imagine us going to space? Now, the thing I love about this genre uh, is that it uh, really it doesn't exist. It can't exist because these idea of, ideas of the future are based on ideas of the future in the past. And now that technology has changed and evolved, uh, we have things that have changed where we think the future is going. And these are sort of 
impossible futures now, futures that won't ever happen, uh, but people in the past imagined. And I just love the aesthetic of them, you know, think flying cars and ray guns and, you know, smooth lines and big ancient computer screens, TV screens and flying uh, cities and, you know, uh, crazy contraptions, living in bubbles on the moon, flying saucers, all sorts of things like that. Um, some famous examples of this uh, are the Jetsons, uh, that cartoon way back in the day. A great example of retrofuturism. Uh, also, the 1939 New York World's Fair had some really in interesting uh, ideas and dioramas, mock-ups of uh, what people thought the future was going to be like. So, I don't know, this genre just really speaks to me, so I wanted to talk about it on a stream at some point, and time travel kind of fit in there. So... Let me share some of uh, some examples of retrofuturism. Now, there's a lot of examples of earthbound retrofuturism. H.G. Wells is one of the most famous uh, uh, writers who wrote a lot of ideas about uh, what a future might look like on Earth. Um, his time machine uh, explores uh, a possible Earth future. War of the Worlds as well, uh, a little bit with uh, astronomy. But I'm going to focus today on some fiction that dives uh, into uh, retrofuturism relating to space, since this is a space stream, of course. Um, so I'm going to start with one of my favorite series, uh, which is uh, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. It started as a trilogy, although there are uh, there are a lot of books he ended up writing. Um, I have a, a collected uh, a collection of uh, four of these books, although I'm missing one of them. I can't remember who I lent that to. So anybody watching, if I lent you my uh, first copy of the Foundation series, please give it back uh, at some point after you're done reading it. Uh, but anyway, uh, these are really cool. So you can see the first three covers here by one of my favorite retro futuristic artists, Michael Whelan. Um, and again, this, this is sort of an art style in addition to a fiction style. But uh, in this uh, imagined future that Isaac Asimov wrote about, um, he, uh, first of all, he wrote this in the 1940s and 50s. So again, before uh, the space race, before we really knew where space technology was traveling or was heading. Uh, but even before the space race, Isaac Asimov imagined a galactic empire spanning the entire Milky Way, over uh, 25 million planets uh, inhabited by humans. Um, now, how many planets are in the Milky Way? Well, uh, there are at least uh, 500 billion planets. Um, let's uh, actually look at the Milky Way. Let's go over to Space Engine here uh, real quick. Um, so, you know, we've got our uh, our neck of the woods, our solar system here, um, but ours is just one of many. Uh, one thing I like to do is connect to the constellation lines, and then if we zoom out far enough, uh, we'll be able to see that all the stars in our night sky are actually just a very tiny fraction of all the 500 billion stars in our galaxy. And we can see... Uh, the outline of the Milky Way here, um, and all of these stars, uh, many of these stars have planets around them, so scientists think that there are at least 500 billion planets, if not more, in our entire galaxy. So again, that is just our night sky, just the stars we can see, uh, but there are so many others that we cannot in our galaxy alone. So we imagined uh, humans colonizing the entire galaxy uh, over the course of a, a couple, uh, a few thousand years, uh, about 10,000 years, give or take, I believe. Um, so, um, you know, how can we colonize these planets and how do we know which planets to colonize? Well, uh, we've talked a little bit about, um, about that uh, in, during past live streams uh, about um, exoplanets. Uh, and I'm going to give a little tease because next week we are actually going to talk more about exoplanets because next week's stream uh, will uh, be all about the Earth, the one planet I actually haven't covered uh, on any of my live streams yet. So we're going to talk about the Earth plus Earth-like planets. Uh, but just to be brief, um, you know, if we're looking for planets uh, that we might be able to colonize like they did in the Foundation series, um, then we might use a technique like gravitational microlensing, which looks at uh, changes in brightness of distant stars uh, as uh, planets move around them and affect the gravitational field uh, or, of, uh, or the gravitational path of light. As we know, uh, light is influenced by gravity. So that's one way to detect um, exoplanets. But anyway, in this series, uh, there are 500 quadrillion humans that live throughout the galaxy. But the weird thing in this series is that nobody remembers where Earth is. So Earth's history is totally lost to time and they don't even know where Earth uh, was. Earth is just uh, sub the stuff of legends and humans have colonized, uh, again, tens of thousands of other planets. Um, now this seems kind of unlikely as we know today uh, there is this thing called the internet and so pretty much nothing is ever lost to time now. Uh, everything is recorded and I imagine, uh, I can't imagine much of a future that humans are still around that we won't know where Earth is. But who knows, maybe the internet uh, breaks or something else comes along that replaces it. But it seems like we probably won't lose the Earth in the, near, in the future. 
Um, another thing in the uh, Foundation series is that, of course, humans have conquered hyperspace travel, uh, and they have for thousands of years. They would have had to, because if you're traveling uh, great distances in, it, uh, in our galaxy, it takes uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of years to get to other planets. Um, the closest star to our sun is four light years away, so even if you could travel the speed of light, it would take four years to get there. And that's not a very efficient way to colonize the galaxy, of course. And, you know, to get across the galaxy would take uh, almost 100,000 years. Um, so in his series, and this is interesting because, again, this is before modern space travel. So he imagined, he was trying to imagine what, how we could travel through space in the future. And in his series, um, the spaceships were actually powered by fossil fuels, <laughs> gasoline, basically. Uh, and then the, uh, the main characters or the, sort of the protagonists of the series uh, uh, end up uh, dominating sort of the... Uh, the lesser technologically advanced uh, groups of people uh, by developing nuclear-powered spaceships. Now, this might seem like a crazy idea, um, but there have been a number of proposals that have proposed ideas for um, uh, spaceships powered by nuclear power. Um, so here's one example. Uh, this is um, called a nuclear pulse propulsion engine and basically the idea and this is a real proposal that nasa has considered uh is you would basically launch a, a nuclear uh explosive device behind a spaceship uh, and the explosion and the compression of that energy would actually push the spaceship sort of like a cosmic pogo stick um, and again, this there is uh, a lot of engineering and scientific proposals all about this idea, uh, and some you know scientists and uh, pacifists especially uh, imagine this is a great way of disposing of all of our nuclear weapons when uh, humanity has uh, joined forces and uh, has you know stopped building nuclear weapons. Of course, that is a bit of an idealized vision of the future, but it would be a great use uh, to put uh, all of our uh, nuclear weapons that are no longer useful. Uh, making a spaceship out of them. Uh, and, you know, another thing, the uh, Perseverance Mars lander uh, is also nuclear powered. Um, so this is the uh, rover that it's on its way to Mars and it's going to arrive this month, actually, in just a couple weeks, uh, in a little uh, over two weeks. On February 18th, uh, the Perseverance rover is going to land on Mars. And this 3D model is loading here. Mars is a great, or sorry, NASA has a great website um, where you can explore all about the Perseverance rover. Um, and uh, so basically I wanted to mention that both Perseverance and its uh, other sibling, Curiosity, uh, is powered by nuclear energy. So its power source uh, uses uh, a thermoelectric generator um, based on a nuclear, uh, a nuclear power source. Um, so uh, pretty cool that uh, we actually already have spacecraft that are powered by nuclear energy. Um, so not entirely science fiction, uh, um, Asimov's ideas, um, but uh, still uh, pretty out there. A couple other fun details about the Foundation series. Um, uh, there was no uh, electronic messaging. Again, this is before emails or computers, really. Uh, so they actually sent messages to each other in capsules uh, written out on uh, film. Uh, and these capsules were shot through tubes or teleported through hyperspace. Just kind of funny imagining uh, instead of electronic messages being sent, actually just putting uh, putting your note in a tube and then sending it into hyperspace. Uh, and then also, you know, this is before computers. So um, Asimov didn't really have computers as part of his stories. Uh, although as he was writing these and his, the series actually went uh, pretty late into the 20th century. The fourth book, for example, uh, was in 1982. Uh, and now it's called Foundation's Edge, and there were actually computers in that, uh, quite a few of them. So his, uh, the, the universe sort of evolved as our vision of the future evolved, but you may argue that that sort of gets away from the realm of retrofuturism. Uh, oh, in one book, uh, or one short story I'd want to give a shout out to, because it's one of my all-time favorite short stories, it might be my favorite short story, uh, by Isaac Asimov, is called The Last Question. So check that out, if uh, you believe you can find that free online to read. All right, let's jump back over to the comments. Just a couple more uh, retrofuturistic topics I want to cover. But Linda is saying hello, uh, and Linda says that they were at the World's Fair. That's awesome. Why, what, which uh, World's Fair were you at? I'd love to know. Uh, Anne says, a watch from downtown KC. Thanks for watching, Anne. Uh, Beth says, do you think aliens are real? Ooh, that's a good question, Beth. Uh, and I'm going to deflect a bit. I've sort of answered that question on some past streams. I'll just say that I think that uh, there definitely is life out there. Uh, so alien life forms, I think, are probably out there somewhere, uh, but we may not really recognize them. So I'm not sure an alien life form will look like a little green person with two eyes, two arms, and ears, and all that stuff. Um, if there is alien life, it's probably unrecognizable to life we have here on Earth, or it might be very simple, multi, you know, single cellular or multicellular, but very simple. 
Um, so, uh, yeah. So again, I, I've talked about that in the past. Um, you know, I'll just give a shout out to uh, one of my favorite streams, uh, which was our Halloween stream last year on October 26th, uh, the Twilight stream, which we did in black and white, uh, where I talked about space mysteries. And uh, one of the mysteries was, is there life out there? So if you want to learn more about that, Beth, I would highly suggest you check that out. Don't forget, all of our live streams, our past ones are on our YouTube channel. Um, and please subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Eric says, when did the retro futurism vision go so dark? Uh, it seems that in the 50s and 60s, the futures was, was cool. Now future visions are generally very dark. Uh, well, that's a good point, Eric. Um, you know, it, it, a lot of people consider the retro futurism genre to kind of end around the early space age because um, our understandings of the future changed a lot. You know, there are still some retro futuristic writings today, but I would argue that those are more just general futurism uh, of today or, you know, cyberpunk is kind of one uh, genre of uh, darker futurism today. Um, and, you know, it, it is unfortunate that a lot of uh, futuristic writings uh, written today seem pretty dark and less hopeful. Um, and maybe people have gotten more cynical. But there are some more hopeful visions of the future. Um, I'll just give a shout out. Uh, you know, I haven't really talked about it. Um, and maybe it'd be a cool topic for a future stream. But comic books are a great example of a more optimistic vision of the future. Um, there are... Uh, you know, or a vision of the present, you could even argue, but a lot of comic books are set sort of in the near future or in a vision of uh, technology that um, could be sort of in the near future. Uh, so uh, they're generally hopeful because, you know, superheroes are almost always hopeful. So there are some writings today uh, that are a bit more hopeful, but um, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, uh, a lot of people uh, just uh, maybe are dissatisfied with how things are today and kind of wish we could go back to those retro futuristic visions. Uh, Linda says, I was at the New York World's Fair. Wow. Oh, that's so awesome. Uh, we'd love to hear about your experience there. Uh, Patience says, Internet might not work in outer space, and especially so far under our galaxy. What does the space crew use to contact Earth? Wavelengths of sound. Ooh, good question. Um, so uh, real astronauts in space uh, co communicate uh, back down to Earth, usually using radio waves. Um, but uh, radio waves are just a type of light, electromagnetic radiation. Um, and radio waves are just wide wavelength um, forms of light that just travel really far, uh, very easily. Um, so mostly it's radio waves. That's how we communicate. That's even how we've tried to communicate with extraterrestrial life by sending radio messages way out into space. And we think if anybody were to ever contact us or receive any signals from space, it would be the radio waves that they'd receive. So. Um, there are probably some uh, places that could have alien life that might start to receive our radio signals, which really started to be broadcast into space all the way back in the 1930s and 40s. Um, so uh, let's see. Brian says, are there any new exciting cameras operating in space? Ooh, that's a good uh, question, uh, Brian. And uh, actually, yes, that's one news thing I didn't uh, talk about, but um, I actually just saw that. Uh, yesterday, I believe, um, that uh, astronauts aboard the space station doing a spacewalk actually installed a brand new HD camera um, aboard uh, the space station. Um, here's a little news article talking about that. Uh, so they did some battery upgrades, but they also installed a new high-def camera. Not sure when that is going to be activated, um, but... Uh, should be very cool. There are some amazing cameras aboard the space station, uh, both, uh, you know, handheld cameras and uh, automated cameras aboard uh, the space station. But, I, you know, I don't know a lot. I haven't done a lot of research about this specific camera. Uh, but um, do, 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 do. let's see. We can read really quick about that. Uh, 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 uh. So I'm not sure, uh, but yeah, so they did install a new uh, camera aboard the space station. So hopefully we'll get some really cool uh, pictures of the Earth from that. Uh, so thanks for asking, Brian. Great question. Amy says uh, the dogs will detect aliens. Probably the dog. All of our dogs will find aliens before we do. Although I got to say, I think cats may be uh, the better candidate for that because I don't know if you've ever seen a cat in the middle of the night just do something really crazy. I think they might uh, be getting messages from aliens. <laughs> Eric says comic books. Really hadn't thought of that. Yeah, comic books are a great, uh, great resource of science fiction writing for sure. All right, um, we are coming up on one hour. I should have known. Streams are always really long. Thank you to everyone who's still tuned in. We are going to be wrapping up soon, so if you have any last-second questions or comments, be sure to put those in now because we'll be ending here in the next few minutes. I really wanted to give a shout-out, though, to uh, one of my favorite series. Oh, you can already see it there. One that a lot, not a lot of people know about, and that is... Uh, ooh, 
It's not going to show up there. Ooh, it's going to ruin my green screen. Um, well, I have a copy of this book here, Out of the Silent Planet um, by C.S. Lewis. Now, uh, C.S. Lewis uh, more famously wrote The Chronicles of Narnia, uh, which were developed into films. Um, but actually, before he wrote The Chronicles of Narnia, he wrote a space trilogy. That's right. C.S. Lewis wrote space science fiction. There's kind of a funny story about uh, why he wrote this. He actually was having a conversation um, with J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, famous for the Lord of the Rings series, um, and he got the idea from Tolkien. Uh, and again, this was before Chronicles of Narnia, the first book written in 1937. So uh, C.S. Lewis cited H.G. Wells as an inspiration, and uh, basically in this story, uh, the main character is drugged and taken aboard a spacecraft to fly to Mars uh, to be sacrificed to the, the things that lived on Mars. Now, in the series, Mars is called Malacandra, um, in this fictional solar system uh, that uh, C.S. Lewis created. And so in his universe, Mars uh, was very lush. It had lakes and streams and rivers, which we know, of course, was the case a long time ago, but is not uh, no longer today. Um, also, gravity was uh, lower than on Earth. Uh, and uh, so in this series, basically, uh, Earth has been exiled by the rest of the solar system. That's why it's known as the Silent Planet. Um, and there are a lot of religious influences, similar to the Chronicles of Narnia. So if you're interested in that type of fiction, um, coupled with some really cool retrofuturism and science fiction traveling the, the solar system, I'd recommend uh, the Space Trilogy. This is one of my all-time favorite books. Um, it's really, really good. Uh, just a good sort of uh, look at philosophy and space travel as well. Um, but so again, there were... Uh, lakes and streams and rivers and, and gravity lower. Now I want to talk about gravity a little bit because in C.S. Lewis's trilo trilogy he specifically talks about gravity and he describes the plants and mountains on Mars in this series as being extremely tall and extremely thin. Well, how do plants actually grow in microgravity? And we actually know the answer to that. Here is uh, a bit of a write-up published by the Japanese Space Agency based on some uh, science that they've done aboard the International Space Station. And just to summarize all this, they have studied plant growth aboard the space station, and they essentially found out um, that uh, plants uh, will not grow taller in microgravity, as C.S. Lewis might have thought. Um, but actually, uh, due to the microgravity, their, their uh, roots and growth uh, paths are a lot more varied. So they won't just grow in one direction. They'll grow in many different directions, and they'll uh, often just seek light sources. Um, and so uh, we have studied plants in space, and we do know that uh, plants will not grow quite like C.S. Lewis thought. Um, but still pretty uh, cool. Another uh, cool series uh, is the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Barsoom series, uh, which was written by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, famously, John Carter of Mars was uh, the first book, and there are a lot of sort of of Mars books. Uh, and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs is, a, of course, a, another famous uh, turn-of-the-century author, uh, and uh, he published this first book of the series in 1912. Now, this vision of Mars is largely based on astronomical speculation at the time. So again, retrofuturism based on science we used to know in the past, but is different today, of course, now that we know the truth about space. Um, and uh, this is kind of a cool callback to another recent stream, uh, because um, Edgar Rice Burroughs based his ideas of Mars in his series on uh, a Pluto researcher named Percival Lowell. And we talked about him during our Pluto live stream uh, back uh, on uh, the 4th of January this year. So just a few weeks ago, we talked about Pluto. Uh, and Percival was instrumental in the search for Pluto. Uh, and uh, he also was looking at Mars. And so at, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, Lowell uh, observed Mars through his telescope. And he actually drew a lot of interesting details of Mars or what, what he could see based on his uh, early telescope or um, you know less advanced telescope compared to telescopes today, of course. Uh, and he uh, drew, this, drew these drawings and wrote about extensive canal systems and oases of water all over the surface of Mars. And he theorized that an advanced civilization may have built them in the distant past to try to tap into water that was frozen on the poles of Mars as a sort of a final source of water for a dying planet. So Lowell and other scientists thought that Mars was dying or was a dead planet, but it thought that it wasn't. Uh, now they thought it was uh, less dead more recently in the past. Of course, today we know that Mars was a lush water-covered planet very long in the past, but that's billions of years ago. But still, pretty cool that um, that you know uh, fictional writers used that modern that well the understanding of science that la back then was considered modern modern to inform their uh, their. The fiction. So in, in his Mars series, Mars is a, a desert planet as well, but there are some uh, sources of water through these canals and um, 
and the inhabitants have, have turned hard and warlike because of these conditions. And the days are hot on Mars and the nights are cold. Although we know that is false today. Uh, it's just very cold on Mars pretty much all the time. This is a misconception mostly due to Mars's color. Uh, it's red color, uh, which kind of gives it sort of a hot desert-like appearance. But we know that color is just from iron oxide, um, which is rust here on Earth. Um, so uh, a lot of ideas about Mars uh, and uh, many other planets and uh, aspects of science fiction in the past. We don't have time, but I do want to give another shout out to our TV astronomy stream uh, in uh, on September 28th of uh, last year. Because on that stream, we talked about Star Trek, the original series, and we could argue that that is a bit of retrofuturism as well uh, in the 1960s, sort of before the space race really took off. Um, and uh, this inspired a lot of... Uh, or was inspired by a lot of science fact at the time, and there are some even modern science facts that kind of tie into Star Trek. So check out that stream if you want to learn more about that. Uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick's uh, seminal film. It's also a great example of retrofuturism. Uh, our uh, uh, second Hollywood stream, uh, which we did um, just a couple weeks ago on the 18th of January this year. Uh, you can learn more about that movie. Uh, and then there's also um, a, a short story, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep uh, by Philip K. Dick, which was famously adapted into Blade Runner, amazing movie. Um, so maybe uh, if there's interest there, we could do a future Hollywood live stream. So let us know if you're interested in that. We could do another live stream in the future about uh, Blade Runner and other uh, movies. There are so many movies that talk about space. Um, we didn't have time to cover all of them in the two streams we've already done. So maybe if we keep these streams going in the future, we might be able to do that then. All right, we're going to start wrapping up, so let's check over in the comments for our last few comments. Uh, Beth says, thank you for your time. I uh, have to go to Scouts. Well, I hope you have a good time at Scouts, Beth, and thanks for watching. And Linda says, at the New York World's Fair, I saw... Uh, I saw we would be able to talk and see each other at the same time and buy things from shopping on TV. That was back in the 60s. Look how long it took to become real. That's amazing. A great example of retrofuturism, right? Uh, yeah, the video messaging, right? Uh, that was a, another famous uh, thing that you see all the time in these visions of the future dating back to the 60s. Um, and, you know, there were some video messaging uh, uh, platforms even in, in the 80s. Uh, even in Fre even uh, the show Friends in the 90s had a video messaging in a very basic form. But it was mostly reserved for companies and very uh, rich people, of course. Um, but, of course, today we all have video messaging in our pockets and we're using it all the time right now, uh, as uh, you very well know. Um, and then buying things, shopping on TV. Well, who, kn who knew that we could buy things from a tiny little device in our pockets? Um, Linda says, thanks again, Patrick. Thank you, Linda, for watching. Uh, Eric asks, where is Phoebe? Yes, Phoebe, my sidekick, is taking a nap in the other room. Uh, she uh, was a bit sleepy today, uh, so I just figured she might want a bit of a break since last week she was a little rambunctious during our stream. But don't worry, Phoebe will be back uh, hopefully next time. Oh, and Amy says, Phoebe must be on a break. She is indeed getting a bit of her beauty sleep. But she's doing very well, don't you worry. Um, Eric get, says, I guess she needs a raise. Um, maybe that's in response to Phoebe. Uh, Phoebe will get a raise in the form of uh, a walnut here a little bit later. Uh, and Patience says she's interested in that uh, live stream uh, coming up. So maybe uh, the live stream on more Hollywood uh, movies. So I'll be, definitely note that, Patience. Uh, hopefully we'll do that. We'll have an opportunity to do that in the future. Got a lot of live streams coming up. Um, and uh, hopefully as this year continues, um, things will uh, things will definitely update about our schedule, uh, both for our live streams and the planetarium. Um, so uh, just stay tuned. If you haven't, if you're watching on our uh, uh, Union Station Facebook page, please go over to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page and like and subscribe to us there. Also, please remember to like and subscribe to us on uh, our YouTube channel, Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium. We're almost at 100 subscribers. That would be so awesome if we get there. Uh, all of our past live streams are on our YouTube channel, so you can find all of those if you're uh, a first-time watcher and have missed any of the amazing topics we've covered in the past, so check those out for sure. As a reminder, watching our live streams is a great way to support the Planetarium, but of course you can come to the Planetarium and watch one of our shows in person. You can buy tickets online in advance, and all of our shows are open to the public. We're also doing laser shows right now, so check out, we've got an awesome laser show scheduled this week. We've got laser prints coming up pretty soon, so that's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be at 4 p.m. on on Thursdays and Fridays. Hopefully evening laser shows are coming soon as well. But of course, uh, supporting the planetarium in that way is a great way uh, to support Union Station. But watching these live streams, it, live streams is excellent as well. And now that I'm slurring my speech, we, were getting, we are getting towards the end of this live stream. So we are going to be wrapping up here in just a second. Uh, Cindy says, thanks again, Patrick. Thanks for watching, Cindy. Uh, video messaging in the 60s. I thought it would look like a TV on the wall. Well, I guess it, you can kind of do that if you 
uh, plug a you plug your phone into the TV maybe, but uh, we'll get there soon. Although these days you can video message from your refrigerator. Uh, so who knows what the future is going to hold. Eric says, great show as always. Thanks for watching as always, Eric. So thank you everybody who uh, has supported us over the uh, past year. We're going to continue these streams. I've got fun topics ahead. Next week we will be doing our first Earth stream. That's right, uh, the last stop on our solar system tour. The only thing I haven't covered. We'll talk about Earth and we'll talk about Earth-like planets, exoplanets. So that should be a lot of fun. Tune in next week, Monday at 6 p.m. Thank you everyone for watching and have a wonderful week. I've been your planetarium specialist, Patrick Hess, and we will see you next time. Bye everybody.